Good evening. Uh, our Bible reading comes from Psalm 2. Psalm 2. Why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Let us break their chains, they say, and throw off their fetters. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will proclaim the decree of the Lord. He said to me, You are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. You will rule them with an iron scepter. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. Therefore, you kings, be wise. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you be destroyed in your way. For his wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. This is the word of the Lord. We have, oops, multi-talented people, don't we? Playing the violin as well as singing. Well done, Genevieve. And then we've got people like Scott who plays the drums. This isn't working. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, who plays the drums and who sings. So we are very blessed to have musicians like that who serve us um, so faithfully Sunday after Sunday. Uh, and then we've got Chloe on the piano, so even uh, we are so grateful for your playing, Chloe. We need more piano, so if you can play the piano, come and talk to us. We'd love to add you to the roster. Um, You know, I don't think Luke and Kylie are here, but for those of you who don't read the newsletter, I'm sure there's no one like that here, but just in case, uh, Luke and Kylie had a baby boy born to them last Sunday uh, and named him Owen Gordon. So we want to congratulate them on the birth of their child, their first child. Um, let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for your glorious Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is everything to us. We are so grateful to know him. We are so grateful that he has made himself known to us. We thank you for the way in which he has given himself fully for us. No holding back. We thank you for the sacrifice on that cross, who of us can ever imagine what suffering he endured so that we don't have to endure such suffering? We thank you for the burden of our sin that he took upon himself and the wonder of his righteous robe that he has clothed, clothed us with. We are so grateful that we can gather together to worship him. And as we continue to worship him, may you open our hearts and minds and ears for Jesus' sake. Amen. In his book entitled Down to Earth, John Lawrence tells the story of a city that dared God to show himself and paid a terrible price. It seems that the city of Messina, Sicily, was the home to many wicked, irreligious people. On December the 25th, 1908, a newspaper published in Messina printed a parody against God, daring him to make himself known by sending an earthquake. 
three days later, on the 28th of December, 1908, the city and its surrounding district was devastated by a terrible earthquake that killed 84,000 people. Do you want to dare God? Do you want to take your chances? I wouldn't recommend it. But there is an actual true story of a city that defied God and paid the penalty for such defiance. This psalm is what is classified as a royal psalm. Now, all of the royal psalms, there are probably about 10 to 15 of them, have a focus on a king, but then have a more distant focus on the Messiah. So when you read a royal psalm like this one, Psalm 2, you must always read it with a view to understanding that when it speaks about the king here, while it's speaking about a king in Jerusalem, it's speaking and pointing forward to the ultimate king, the Lord Jesus Christ. Never lose sight of that in the royal psalms, otherwise you will misread them. And this psalm is about the rule of God, about the rule of God through his king, and that ultimately finds fulfillment in the Messiah who will exercise his rule in this world so that all will ultimately acknowledge and bow down to that rule. So come with me as we see how this unfolds in the psalm and how it has application for all of us here tonight and for the world out there. Firstly, I want you to notice God's guilty subjects. Look at verses 1 to 3. God's guilty subjects. Why do the nations conspire and the people's plot in vain? There is a a sense, if we can just pause there briefly, there is a sense of astonishment that is being expressed by God. So when he asks that question, it's as if God is saying, what's wrong with these nations? Don't they understand that for all their plotting, all their conspiring, all of their rebellion against me, it's all worthless? Are they so blinded by their ignorance so blinded in their rebellion that they don't understand that they're wasting their time. It is in a sense that God is trying to help these nations to understand that He ultimately is sovereign over them. And even though they may think they can shake off the shackles of His rule, they can't. Why do the nations plot in vain. The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers gather together against Yahweh and against his anointed one. Let us break their chains, they say, and throw off their fetters. Now, the occasion on which the psalm uh, speaks is a coronation of a king. When a king was coronated in Jerusalem, a couple of things happened. They put a crown on his head, they gave him a scroll uh, as part of his co a coronation, an important document. They then proclaimed the coronation, and then they anointed him as king. And so this is the occasion of a coronation. It's not a literal coronation because it's looking forward to the coronation of the ultimate king and also looking forward to the coronation of a Davidic king. So the kings that come in the line of David, it really reminds us of the promise given by the prophet Nathan to uh, David in 2 Samuel 7, where it talks about this enduring line of succession of kings that will come from David that will ultimately be realized in the Messiah. And this is a coronation of one of those kings. And so it is... The, the king that God installs in Zion, and therefore it is God's king. There is a special relationship with the king that God has installed in Zion. And thus God will aid this king to suppress all rebellion against him, in spite of the nations that try and to rebel. 
in the more distant future, of course, looking forward, it speaks about the kingship of the Lord Jesus Christ. It speaks about the fact that as Jesus Christ comes into this world, he comes born as a baby, but he is a king. And his kingdom breaks into the world with his coming. And people come into the kingdom of God as they submit to the lordship of Christ. And so his kingdom in that sense grows as more and more people add it to it. And it speaks about the fact that Jesus, as the king, is anointed of God. He comes with God's anointing on him. You remember what John the Baptist, when he's there and, the, and he baptizes Jesus, what happens? Can you all remember? The Spirit of God descends on him. And there is a voice from heaven saying, This is my Son, in whom I am well pleased. And so it is talking about the fact that even when Jesus comes as king, even though he's anointed of God, what does Jesus suffer? Rebellion. He suffers people going against him. He suffers people trying to kill him. He suffers people walking away from him. I think that passage in John 6 can be so sad towards the end of John 6, where Jesus talks about the cost of following him. You remember the passage. And then all the disciples who are following him disappear. And Jesus turns to the 12 and he says to them, are you also going to go? And of course, Peter, who is the one who blurts out frequently, says, to whom else can we go? You have the words of eternal life. You are Jesus Christ, the Lord. But the arrest disappear. And so it speaks about this rebelliousness amongst humanity. Here the kings who are rebelling against God's king in Zion are demonstrating their rebellion against God. Why is it that we so want to rebel against God? I know we don't like talking about sin and we kind of, you know, don't want to hear stuff about sin. But the reality is that all of us, without exception, are born rebels. You are intrinsically someone who wants to do what God has told you not to do. By nature, we are rebels. So the psalmist, I, this psalm, David, after his episode with Bathsheba, gives a psalm of confession in Psalm 51. This is what he says in verse 5. Surely I was sinful at birth. Now here. Sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Just pause for a moment and think that one through. Sinful from the time my mother conceived me. No one is born righteous in this world. No one. And so as Paul writes to the Romans in chapter 3, verses 9 and 10, he says, there is none, quoting from Isaiah, I think it is quoting from Isaiah, he says, there's no one who is righteous. No, not one. We are all born sinners in God's sight. And thus such rebellion against God as sinners is then evidenced by how we act. All of us follow through with that sinful nature with which we are born. Which is why that at the ultimately all of us without exception are guilty before God. You can't get away from that. And until we acknowledge our guilt... We can never experience the magnificence of God's grace. Because it's when we understand our rebellion against God, and our heart and our sinful hearts really are, and how plagued we are from head to toe with sin, only then will we come to understand the incredible grace of God in Christ who dies on a cross to forgive us of our sin. He does it to rebels. He does it for people who hate him. And he does it to those who stand without excuse, guilty before him. And yet the magnificence of God's king 
is that God's king becomes a baby and becomes a man and dies on a cross in order so that we might have our guilt removed, our guilt taken away, freed from the shackles of sin. Thus, Paul preaching in Acts 17 verse 30 makes this simple statement. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now, because Christ has come, now he commands all people everywhere to repent. All people everywhere to repent. God's guilty subjects. Now, as we sit here this evening, I know that this sometimes is an uncomfortable subject. I know that we want to hear about nice things, but Scripture includes these things so that it would drive us to Jesus, so that it would cause us in our desperation to say, who will rescue me? Who will deliver me? Who will ultimately enable me to find relief from my guilt? Who will cleanse my conscience? Where can I get it cleansed? And we find relief in Jesus Christ, who cleanses us from all sin and unrighteousness when we repent. Secondly, notice God's great scorn. Look at verses 4 to 6. God's great scorn. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Now, if you do a study in Scripture, and maybe someone from this congregation can write a, a thesis one day about it, and you look at all the instances that laugh is used in the Scripture, most of them are a derisional kind of laugh. And the laugh here of God is laughing at the futility of their rebellion. It's as if God is in heaven saying, this is just so pointless. What do they think they're going to achieve? God laughs at their rebellion, scoffs at them. Then he rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in, their, in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy hill. The change of scene is, is from the, these helpless kings who are rebellion to an omnipotent creator who oversees and is sovereign and is able to quell their rebellion and squash any sign of rebellion against him. God will accomplish his purposes with or without us. God is not phased. God is not concerned. God is not panicking when we rebel, when we try and shake off his shackles, when we deny him, when we ignore him, when we pretend that there is no God out there, when we live life on our own terms, when we become so self-centered that God is relegated into the background, when we have governments who deny him. God's not concerned about that. God's not Worried about that, he laughs at their feeble attempts of rebelling. The emphatic I in verse 6, look at verse 6, I is in the emphatic, have stored my king. God frustrates the plans of the wicked. God frustrates those who seek to rebel against him. Listen to his word. I'm not making this up. Psalm 33 verse 10 makes this declaration. Yahweh foils the plans of nations. He thwarts the purposes of people. But the plans of Yahweh stand firm forever. The purposes of his heart through all generations. Isaiah 14, 27. For Yahweh Almighty has purpose, and who can thwart him? His hand is stretched out, and who can turn it back? Or Isaiah 19, 3. The Egyptians will lose heart, and I will bring their plans to nothing. So at a cosmic level, and then we're going to go to a personal level, at a cosmic level, God is saying, 
I am in charge. And even though there may be governments that are installed around the world that rebel against me, they are only there by my divine permission. And I still will thwart their evil plans and purposes. God is sovereign. And God will accomplish all that he sets out to do. Now this is true also at a personal level. Sometimes it's so easy for us to respond and live life with anxieties and fear. What if something happens to me? What if I don't have a full life? What happens if I die in a car accident or get caught up in some kind of event that is a freakish in nature? And it's so easy for us to live life in the shadows, wondering whether or not we're going to make our 70th birthday. Some of you have already made that and have passed that. But notice what God reminds us of in Proverbs 16, verse 9. In a man, in his heart, a man plans his course, but Yahweh determines his steps. Many are the plans in a man's heart, but it's Yahweh's purpose that prevails. God's purposes for you will prevail. You may get cancer in your 20s. God forbid that that happens, and I really mean that, but I know people who have had cancer in their 20s. But know this, that whatever you experience in life, every single purpose that God has planned in advance for you will come to pass. Nothing can stop it. Nothing. And God sometimes works in unusual ways. I came across this when I was reading about Albert Schweitzer. Late one evening, a professor sat at his desk working on the next day's lectures. He shuffled through the papers and mail placed there by his housekeeper. He began to throw them in the waste paper basket when one magazine, not even addressed to him, but delivered to his office by mistake, caught his attention. It fell open to an article titled, The Needs of the Congo Mission. The professor began reading it idly, but then he was consumed by these words. The need is great here. We have no one to work the northern province of Gabon in central Congo, and it is my prayer as I write this article that God will lay his hand on one, one on whom already the master's eyes have been cast, that he or she shall be called to this place to help us. The professor closed the magazine and wrote in his diary, my search is over. He gave himself to go to the Congo. His name was Albert Schweitzer. That little article hidden in a periodical intended for someone else was placed by accident in human terms in his mailbox. By chance in human terms, the housekeeper put it on his desk. By chance, he noted the title. And Schweitzer became one of the great figures of the century. By chance, no, by God's divine purposes. The ultimate focus on the psalm, however, is Christ. Because ultimately God will establish Christ's throne. Ultimately God will rule through Christ. Ultimately it will be he who defeats his enemies. And God's purposes will be full, fulfilled for Jesus. And his plans for his son will be ultimately accomplished. And even the plans for Christ's return will be fulfilled so that no one will be able to thwart God's plans for Jesus. And when you think about that, through a line of despotic kings, when you read through the books of Chronicles and Kings, there are hardly any good kings, but through the line of David, in spite of their rebellion, in spite of their turning away from God, in spite of their evil, Right down, there is an unbroken line till Jesus Christ is born. And God accomplishes his purposes. And ultimately, in the same way that these kings bow down 
to the king installed on Zion. We are told and was read to us earlier, every knee from our Zion will bow and every tongue will confess. So for whatever rebellion occurs in this world, the answerability to God will occur one day. It's hard as a Christian sometimes to see it, isn't it? We look around us and we see a world out of control. We see a chaotic world. We see all kinds of issues that are defiant in terms of what God has revealed in His Word. We can't help at times become frustrated and wonder how it is that we've got to some of these points we've got to in history. How it is that this chaos seems to reign and how it is that wicked people seem to prevail. And in the end, God assures the Christian, they will bow, they will confess, they will submit, they will acknowledge Christ. And so the question then that we need to grapple with is either you do it now or you do it in eternity. Those are your choices. Either you bow the knee now to Christ, either you submit now to His Lordship, or one day God will call you to account and you will confess Him as Lord. And then thirdly, I want you to notice God's glorious Son, verses 7 to 9. Look at verses 7 to 9. I will proclaim the decree of Yahweh, He said to me. This is, these are beautiful words that come out here. He said to me, you are my son. Today I've become your father. Now that's not in a literal sense to the king that God installs in Zion. That is God's way of renewing the covenant between him and his people, between him and the king. This is God's way of saying, I've entered into a very special relationship with the king in Zion. I regard him as my son. And so it is God who through the king rules the world. It is not that this king rules on his own steam. It is rather as this king submits to the rule of God, that he is accountable and responsible, that he ensures that it is Yahweh's rule that uh, is implemented throughout his kingdom and throughout the world. It's not about the king doing what he wants to do. It is about the king doing what God wants him to do. And thus the law of God is specified. It's written down. And it is the king's responsibility to ensure that he applies the law of God consistently in the rule of the kingdom. Because he is responsible and ultimately accountable to God. The king was God's representative of earth, put there by God. But it also looks to the future king. Because this is ultimately fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ, who is God's son, literally, who comes into the world as God's son, and who sets up a covenant between himself and his people, a new covenant between God and his people. Today I become your father. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. You will rule them with an iron scepter. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. Here is speaking about the universal rule of the king. Now to be sure that all the kings in Zion, in Jerusalem, none of them had that universal rule over the world. They ruled their kingdom. And under David, David conquered many other kingdoms. And David uh, had a very powerful rule. Under Solomon, there was peace. And then the kingdom of Israel fell apart. So when you hear this about the inheritance of the earth, the possession of the world, it's clearly looking forward to the Lord Jesus Christ, who will ultimately rule the world as king. For he is God's established king. And he will ensure that all the nations of the earth, no matter who they are, all the peoples from every culture, will ultimately bow down and acknowledge him as Lord. Why? 
because we are told in Matthew 28, verses 18, then Jesus came to them and said, this is after his resurrection, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And therefore, by implication, since he has all authority to him, all will answer to him. All are accountable to him. He will finally crush all opposition when he comes again and establishes his kingdom. He allows, he permits opposition to continue to be exercised in this world. But there is a final day coming when Jesus Christ will return into this world and all opposition will be ceased. Don't you look forward to that as a Christian? At last, at last, you won't have to fight battles against things that are contrary to God. At last, you won't have to worry about the wicked prevailing. At last, you will be able to rest in true peace. At last, there will be no conflict. At last, you will no longer suffer persecution and difficulties because people oppose you because you're a Christian. Jesus shall reign where'er the sun does his successive journeys run. His kingdom reign from shore to shore till, moon and earth, till earth and moon shall wane and wax no more. Here is the, the rule of King Jesus established because he is God's son. He is in special relationship with God the Father. And God the Father confers on him because of his work on the cross all authority on heaven and on earth. And his kingdom will come into this world. And from every tribe and every language and every nation, there will be a multitude, we are told in Revelation, there will be a multitude that no one can number who will be part of that kingdom and who will come under the lordship of the Lord Jesus Christ. And there is a day coming when Jesus will separate the sheep from the goats. And so until that day arrives, Christian, you who are saved here, you who look forward to that day, you who anticipate it and can't wait for that day, you and I need to be out there telling people that the time to turn is now because when Christ comes, it's too late then. And then people are thrust into an eternity where they will experience in submission to God the wrath of God forever. I can think of nothing more horrific than that. Can you imagine God's full wrath that Jesus experienced on the cross, having to endure that forever and having to endure the eternal separation from all that is good about God forever. That is the end of those who rebel against God. That is the end of those who think that God is a figment of the Christian's imagination. And so while there is time, Paul writes to the Ephesians in chapter 5 and he says, make use of every opportunity. Don't let the time pass you by. Get out there and remind, warn people of what is to come before it's too late. And who knows when Christ will return? None of us knows. And since we don't know, the urgency is even more urgent. And then finally, God's gracious statement. Look at verses 10 to 12. He warns them, and then he says, Therefore, you kings be wise. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve Yahweh with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you be destroyed in your way. For his wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. This is God's gracious invitation when he says, kiss the son, that is a, a phrase that really means submit to God. While you are in this world, while you have time, 
He calls these kings, carefully assess your position. Carefully think about your rebellion. And while you are in this world, turn before it's too late. Turn to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth. God's patience and grace is extended. He understands the frailty of man. He understands that man's heart is full of rebellion. And so rather than destroying them on the spot, which he has every right to do, he extends a hand of mercy and grace and says, Turn, turn, come to me while there's time. Pay homage to the king. And it is such submission, full, warm-hearted submission. This isn't a reluctant submission to God. This isn't a kind of a coerced submission. This is a joyful submission to Christ. This is coming and bringing yourself at the foot of the cross and laying it all out there and experiencing the wonder of God's mercy and the wonder of God's grace and the wonder of God's forgiveness and the lifting of the burden of sin and the removal of the change, change that fetter us and that hold us chained to Satan. It's a breaking of that. And there's glorious blessedness. Doesn't he say that? Look at verse, the end of verse 12. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Come to me, all you who are burdened and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Rest for your soul. Rest from sin. Rest from the chains that bind you to Satan. I will give you rest. Can I say to you, there is only blessedness and full submission to Christ. You know, we can think about this in terms of unbelievers, and that's true. But what about you and I? What about our own hearts? What about sometimes the, the sinful things that we allow ourselves to engage in? Now, God doesn't convict us of sin in order to make life horrible for us. God convicts us of sin because he knows that if we continue to act in those ways, we are robbing ourselves of the fullness of life that Jesus Christ has come to bring. I have come that you might have life abundance, says Jesus in, in, in John 10, verse 10b. The thief comes to rob, to steal, and to destroy. But I've come that you might have life to the full. And when we allow the thief to come and whisper in our ears and tempt us and we respond to that temptation, it is that rebellion against God that robs us of joy. It robs us of the, the, the joy of the fullness of life that Christ has come to give. And so we come again and again and again to the cross where we say, Lord, yes, I need to confess my sin. I need to turn from that sin. I need to resubmit myself to your Lordship so that you might reign in my life. You know, I know you've probably heard this one before. It's a well-known illustration. I said this morning, like the principal of the college I was at, he used to repeat his illustrations over and over again. By the fourth year, you knew them off by heart. Um, and I feel a bit like that sometimes. This is a transcript, an actual transcript, of a radio conversation between the U.S. naval ship and the Canadians off the coast of Newfoundland on October 1995. This is not that long ago. That was released by the chief naval operations on the 10th of October, 1995. Canadians, please divert your course 15 degrees to the south to avoid collision. Americans, recommend you divert your course 15 degrees to the north to avoid collision. Canadians, negative, you will have to divert your course 15 degrees to the south to avoid collision. Americans, this is captain of a U.S. Navy ship. I say again, divert your course. Canadians, negative. I say again, you will have to divert your course. Americans, we are the aircraft carrier USS Lincoln, the second largest ship in the United States Atlantic Fleet. We are accompanied by three destroyers, three cruisers, and numerous support vessels. I demand that you change your course 15 degrees north. I say again, that is 15 degrees north, or countermeasures will be undertaken to ensure the safety of the ship. Canadians, we are a lighthouse, your call. 
We're sometimes like that, aren't we? We know the right path. God's shouting in our ears. And our old sinful nature comes to the surface. That nature that was put to death. That old flesh. And we divert, of course. And God says, come back, come back into course. And he screams at us and says, I'm the immovable object. You need to move, not me. And we need to resubmit ourselves. That's why I've heard it said from many different well-known preachers, every morning when I get up, I preach the gospel to myself. We need it every morning, don't we? If you're anything like me, I sin every day. Yeah, I hate to say that, but it's true. Whether it's in the thought, or whether it's in words, or whether it's in deeds. And so every day I need to come before God and say, Lord, forgive me. Because I know God's forgiveness is assured in Christ. It is certain. It is definite. And then the joy of His salvation is restored in my heart, in my life. And I experience the blessedness of what it means to live in submission to the Lordship of Christ. I experience the joy of being in sync with Jesus. And I lose that joy whenever I step out of the path that God has laid out before me. And what is true of me, I suspect, is true of you as a Christian. When we say we have no joy, it's because there's something wrong in our relationship with Christ. Our joy is bound up in Him. Bound up in fellowship with Him. Bound up in submission to Him. And if you are an unbeliever here this, morning, uh, this evening, it's even, even worse. For you will experience no inner joy until you have brought your life in absolute submission to Christ. And you bow at the foot of the cross. And you take that burden you've been carrying for so long. And you lay it at the feet of and Jesus says, I'll take your burden. And with it, I'll replace it with a light yoke and joy and fulfillment in Christ. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for your word this evening. What a glorious word it is. We thank you for your son. What a glorious son he is. May you enable us, if we know you, to daily be submitting ourselves to you and your lordship that we might experience the fullness of the spirit and the fullness of the joy of your salvation. And if there be any here who have yet to submit to you and have yet to bring their lives in repentance to you and have yet to confess their rebellion against you, may you draw them to yourself. May you bring them to the foot of the cross and may they find life for Jesus' sake. Amen. Now before we close in a song, we are going to have a video of...